Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good, 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 good. Um, yeah, I do like the fall weather. It's always kind of feels like football weather out there. It's kind of nice. Uh, my name is Matt Dumas. Great to see you guys uh, this weekend. You know, last week we started our story uh, with Cornelius. Uh, and it's hard to overstate how important the Cornelius story is, not only to the book of Acts, but also to the history of the church and for the kingdom of God. Uh, it, it's one of those stories that, that, that really marks the changing of everything. It's no less than God fulfilling an ancient promise to a guy named Abraham that through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And with Cornelius coming in as the first Gentile, symbolically in the book of Acts, now the floodgates are open for the church to expand to the uttermost parts of the earth and to all people groups. You know, it's one of those seismic events in history. If you think about uh, the fall and the, the flood, the call of Abraham, uh, the exodus from Egypt, the entering in of the land, the giving of the law, the crowning of a guy named David as king, the fall of the nation, uh, them going into exile, and then their return, the coming of a guy named Jesus, his death and his resurrection, and the anticipation of his return. You know, the kingdoms of this earth, they've risen and they've fallen, but the kingdom of God marches on in every political environment imaginable. Whether it's a king in power or whether it's the people, whether it's capitalism or communism, whether it's Christian or atheistic, God still reigns supreme. And from this point in the book of Acts, as we look forward, we're going to see the gospel go out from, the, uh, from this area right now where they are, from Jerusalem. We're going to see it starting to spread to the uttermost parts of the earth. As we said before, a couple of weeks ago, that, that, that we have received a baton, right? That, that through the, the years that the faithful men and women have passed on the baton of faith from one person to the next. And now we have that baton. And what are we going to do with it? So today we'll finish up with Cornelius as we continue our story in the book of Acts. Please turn to Acts 10 and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and I thank you for just the opportunity once again to worship you, to be in your house. And Father, uh, as we'll see today and over the next week or so, what a tremendously big deal it is that we Gentiles get to be a part of your kingdom and help us never to lose sight of just your amazing grace and your amazing love. Lord, I thank you for Autumn and for her story and the way that you're using uh, not only her story, but uh, her willingness to serve you to impact many lives here at Central and in this valley. And Lord, I pray for each one of us that, that Lord, you would help us to take the story that you have been uh, writing in our lives and how our story intersects with yours and use that to impact other folks. And Lord, I do pray as this, the, the, the world around us shakes, whether it's uh, literally shaking with an earthquake or a tsunami or whether it's, it's the uh, divisions that we see in our country. That, Father, we know we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That ultimately, we have a king who will never be overthrown. And we long for the day when we see him again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a look at verse 23. And on the next day, he got up and went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day, he entered Caesarea, and now Cornelius was waiting for them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. 
That is why I came without any, even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I asked, for what reason you have sent for me? Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. At Cornelius' request, Peter, along with some other Jewish believers, leave Joppa and head to Caesarea. And Peter does this without hesitation. It's, he gets up in the morning, he saddles his donkey, his horse, his uh, camel, whatever. He saddles them up and he heads out. No hesitation. We're going to find that's a bit unusual a little bit later on. Meanwhile, Cornelius is waiting for Peter and his group to show up. Now remember, this is at a time when there were no cell phones. Uh, there was no email. I couldn't call ahead to tell them that I'm on my way. I'm almost there. I couldn't text them and say, hey, five minutes and I'll be at your house. No, Cornelius just had to wait. He didn't know for sure when Peter was going to show up. But this tells us a little bit about Cornelius. He's waiting. He's anxiously anticipating uh, Peter showing up and the message that God has for him. This is highly unusual for a Roman soldier to meet with a Jewish man. From both ends, the Roman soldier to welcome a Jewish man into his home or for a Jewish man to actually go into a Roman's home. This is very unusual, and yet there we find Cornelius excited, waiting to hear what Peter has to say. We said it last week, but it reminds us of the parable of the soils, that that Cornelius is the good soil. Right? His heart is prepared, and when the word uh, lands on it, no doubt it will bear much fruit for the kingdom. Now, what is Cornelius doing while he's waiting? Well, he's calling together some folks, right? His household, his relatives, and his good friends. We call that our impact list, the people who are in our lives, those folks that that we already have contact with. That's who Cornelius calls. He says, hey guys, come over to my house. A guy named Peter's going to come and he's going to tell us a message from God. You see, not only was Cornelius excited about hearing about Jesus, he wanted those closest to him to hear the good news. He wanted them to have a life-changing impact with God. And the question is, who in your life needs to hear that message? Who in your life uh, would you be excited to say, hey, you need to hear this message about Jesus. Who in your life do you need to tell about him? Who? Peter shows up. And Cornelius falls down before him. Now, Peter thinks that Cornelius is worshiping him. I don't think he's actually worshiping him because Cornelius is a God-fearer. And we talked about that last week. That means that Cornelius worships the true God, the God of Israel. He's not a pagan who worships idols. He's not a pagan who's going to worship a man. He worships the true God. And so he's showing respect to Peter. But this kind of highlights... um, why the Jews were a, a little bit hesitant, well, not really a little bit, a lot hesitant to come in and see Gentiles. One of the reasons was that Gentiles were considered, I, I, hold on, just idolatrous, idol worshipers, right? They were considered uh, idolatrous. They, they, they worship false gods and idols. And so that was one of the reasons that a Jew would not go into their house. But when Peter enters, he finds not idols there, but a group of people gathered to hear him. Peter says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to even visit him. If we go back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 7, that God says through Moses to the, the children of Israel, he says, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples in the earth. 
And he didn't choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, because you were the fewest of of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you, and he kept the promise, the the covenant he made with your forefathers. He didn't choose you because you were the best looking. He didn't choose you because you were the strongest or the fastest. He didn't choose you because somehow you have a really cool last name. He chose you because he chose you. Because of his great love and the promise he made to a guy named Abraham. That, that through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That, that, the, that his choosing them didn't mean that they were going to be the only ones. But that through them, everybody would have a chance to know this God. Uh, Moses says in Exodus 19, he says, you are a kingdom of priests. The role of the priest is to present the people to God and God to the people. And so Israel is to be a go-between, a go-between between the nations and this great and awesome God. They were to lead the nations in worshiping this most holy, most uh, blessed of, of gods. The creator of the universe. Merciful, long-suffering, loving. That was Israel's job. And God told them, he said, be careful because when you go into the land, there are going to be a lot of folks doing some naughty things around you. Don't do those naughty things. Don't worship idols and don't practice wickedness. You're to be an example to them. You're to lead them to me. If you read through the Old Testament, how do you think Israel did at that job? Not very well. In fact, they did miserable at that job. Instead of leading the nations to worship the one true God, they allowed the nations to to corrupt them, to lead them away from the worship of God. Over and over again that God raised up prophets and he pursued after his people saying, come back, come back, come back, come back. And over and over and over again, they said, no, no, no the story of Hosea, an unfaithful people and a faithful God. And because of their rebellion, God sent them into exile. And so they were in exile for a number of years. And then even after he brought them out of exile, in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, you see that one of the main problems is that the people are still intermarrying with the peoples of the land. They're still following their ways. And so for 400 years from the time of Malachi to the time that Jesus shows up, the gospels open. Israel is kind of a chew toy between two major superpowers, the Greeks and the Romans. And this little piece of real estate that once was called the promised land is a land that's fought over. And the Israelites, the Jews, finally learned their lesson. But the pendulum swung the other way. And so for them, they would have no dealings with the Gentiles if they could help it. So when Peter says it's unlawful for a Jewish man to meet with a with with a gent or visit a stranger, it wasn't technically against the law to do that. It was against Jewish tradition. You see, in the law, God had said that you're to treat strangers, which would be the foreigners that he talks about, the same way you treat widows and orphans. Now, how are they to treat widows and orphans? Good or bad? Really good, right? You're to pursue them. You're to love them. You're to take care of them. You're to be uh, this picture of God's love for them. So you're to put your arm around and make sure they're taken care of. That's the way you're to treat strangers in your midst. They just weren't supposed to adopt their ways. But see, Peter had grown up in a culture And he had grown up in a tradition that said that all Gentiles, all foreigners, were unclean. And so God has to to, to, um, shake up that bias by giving him a vision, which on the surface looks like animals in a kosher diet. But now Peter realizes it's about people. And that he's to call no one unholy or unclean. In other words, there's nobody too far gone that Jesus can't reach them, right? There's nobody too far gone that Jesus cannot reach them. 
Let's stop there for a minute. What is keeping you from sharing your story? Is there prejudice or bias that's keeping you from telling your neighbor about Jesus? Is there something that's causing a roadblock? Do they have too many tattoos or, or, or maybe they use too filthy a language or maybe they're from that part of town or maybe they, culturally they're different than I am? What is it that's keeping you from telling them about Jesus? Is there anyone too far gone that he can't save them? And how might he want to use you to bridge some of those gaps? Cornelius tells his story to Peter, and Peter is then invited to share about Jesus. Let's take a look at verse 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. This is Peter's third and final recorded sermon in the book of Acts. It's similar to the first two sermons he had, but different. You see, in the first two sermons, Peter was addressing the Jewish people. And when he's addressing the Jewish people, he puts his finger in their face and he says, you guys murdered your Messiah. Right? You murdered the one who was sent to save you. But that's not how he starts off here, is it? He said, now I see that God is not one to show partiality. It's a, it's a theme that Paul picks up on in his writings. It's not about the ancestry, but it's about faith. Doesn't matter who your parents were or who your grandparents were. It doesn't matter what your walk of life was before. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter. What matters is not that you're a descendant of Abraham, but that you have the faith of Abraham. Right? And here Peter says that he sees that God in every nation. Right? That God has those who fear him and do good things, right? And then are acceptable. It reminds us of Micah 6, 8, where he says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. But see, it starts with fearing God, right? That comes first. And then you have doing what's right. You fear him, right? Which means you believe, and then you do what's right. You can't get those confused, right? Because doing what's right, you can't do until you believe, right? But once you believe, there are good works that you're saved to walk in. You see, when Jesus, uh, when we have an encounter with him, he changes everything. He takes us from death to life. He gives us a new purpose and a new destiny so that we would walk in that new purpose and we would pursue that new destiny. So the question is, 
with those folks who know you best or maybe don't know you that well at all? Would they know by the things that you say and the things that you do that you follow Jesus? Would they know you belong to him by the way you conduct yourself? Would they be able to look at your life and would they be able to say, aha, that's one of them? Are you letting your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven? Right? Because that's what it's all about. Peter says in every place there are folks who have trusted in him, right, Jesus, and now are walking in those good works. That Jesus came to reconcile us, to bring real peace, peace with God and peace among men. Even in the midst of the crazy political environment we're in, it's not our politics that unite us. It's not that we are in the same country that unites us. It's that we serve the same God, right? That's what unites us. And so Peter is going to review Jesus' ministry, and he talks about Jesus, that he was the one who was anointed by God. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, and so he did all kinds of miraculous things. That he is Lord of all, not just of the Jews. And what does it mean if he's Lord of all? What does that word all mean? All. Everything. Every person and everything. He is Lord of all. That he was crucified, he was killed, but on the third day that God raised him up and has appointed him to this position. That he would be judge of the living and the dead. Now I think that covers just about everybody, right? You're either alive or you're dead. That he's the judge of all. So that those who believe in him have forgiveness of sins, just as all the prophets said in the Old Testament. And Peter, as a capital A apostle, is a witness of those things. Now, Peter is really, I mean, he's just getting into stride there. He's in the middle of his sermon, and he's, he's working up a sweat. Wow, he's, he's really going after it. And guess what happens? He gets interrupted. Right? He gets interrupted. Now, who would do such a thing? The Holy Spirit. Right? He's in the middle of speaking, right in the middle of his sentence, and all of a sudden, the Spirit falls on the people who are listening. Just as he did on the apostles at Pentecost. All of a sudden, the Spirit falls on these guys. Uh, it's poured out on the Gentiles. And the Jewish believers who were there are amazed. Amazed. Now, why would they be amazed, do you think? Because you guys are Gentiles. They're amazed, not that the Holy Spirit has come. They're amazed that he would come on you guys. Are you kidding me? The Gentiles, they get the Spirit too? You see, the promise was for the Jews. The new covenant, Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 36, both places where he talks about the new covenant. It's not like the covenant I made with your forefathers, the covenant with they, which they broke even though I was a father of, for them, and led them out. How many of you guys are Jews in here? See, that wasn't your covenant. And so he's not making a new covenant with you. He's making it with the, the people who broke the old covenant. Who is that? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. My ears don't work as well, right? Jews, a new covenant I make with you. And I'll give you a new heart and my spirit will come and live in you. See, we're thousands of years later and we think that's all for us. So we're like, well, what's the big deal? 
It's a huge deal because it wasn't our promise. It was theirs. It's the promise that Jesus in the upper room, and he's talking to his disciples, right? He says that this is the new covenant in my blood. They knew exactly what he was talking about. The Spirit would be coming. And now all of a sudden the Spirit is given to the Gentiles? you got to be kidding me. We'll talk about this more next week. But they're surprised that even the Gentiles get the Spirit. Now, how did they know they had the Spirit? They were glowing? I don't know. That says they spoke in other tongues. Now, we saw that happen at Pentecost as well, right? At Acts chapter 2. They're, they're in Jerusalem, the Feast of Pentecost. And who is gathered in Jerusalem, do you think, for the Feast of Pentecost? What people group? Jews, right? And they're coming from all uh, different points of the earth. And they're all coming to Jerusalem uh, so that they can celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. So when the apostles speak in tongues, they're speaking in the tongues of the people who come from all over the earth. And they can hear them in their own languages. Now, now this isn't Jews. This is Gentiles. And they're not coming from all over the earth. They're coming from Cornelius' neighborhood. So presumably, they all speak the same language, right? Koine Greek, they all would have spoke the same language. So why are they speaking in tongues? Genesis chapter 11. Remember in Genesis chapter 11, we as a people did a naughty thing. Floods take, uh, floods already over. And our first group project, the first thing we thought, man, here's a good idea. God said to spread out and fill the earth. We said, nah, we don't like that idea. Let's build a big tower. A tower whose top reaches into heaven. And let's do it so we can be our own gods and we can worship our own thing. We don't have to listen to this other God. So God comes down and he confuses the languages. And he forces us to spread out. And he forces us to spread out. And so when you have these other languages that are spoken in Acts 2, symbolically you have this bringing in, it's the reversal of the curse because now everybody hears about this great God in their own language. It's as if they had had one language. And for the Gentiles, the ones who were spread out, again, symbolically, they're brought into this one new community called the church. Right? And so uh, the sign of it. Now, Peter says... Right? They, they believed, they've received the Holy Spirit. He says, what do we do next? Let's baptize them, right? They believed. How do we know they believed? Because they have the Holy Spirit. We saw signs of that. And so because they believed in, in, in the, the evidence of the Spirit, what's the next thing they do? Get baptized. So does baptism save you? No, they're already saved. How do we know? Because they already have the Spirit. Right there. They've already had forgiveness of sins over here, so baptism doesn't save them. They're already saved. Baptism is a picture of what's happened already for these believers. Right? Their, Their lives have been changed. They've gone from death to life. And so it's an outward expression of an inward transformation. And they're baptized. Let's see if I missed anything here. And baptism will mark them, identifies them with the new community called the church. So Peter shares the gospel with Cornelius and his household. They believe in Jesus and are saved. They receive the Holy Spirit and are baptized that uh, Jesus had told his apostles, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Here we're seeing the final kingdom key turned, the door thrown wide open. And now the gospel will spread from here to the ends of the earth. And if you haven't yet trusted in Jesus, if you're here today and you haven't trusted in Jesus, my question is, why not? What is holding you back. You see, Peter says it. 
And it's not just because Peter says it, but it, it's true. That each and every one of us, I don't, I don't know if this is news to you, but every one of us is going to die. Death is one for one. Nobody escapes it. You can prolong it as long as you want, and you can get all the kind of stuff going for you that you want to go. You can go to the gym every day and eat all the right stuff, but Myron, you can testify that doesn't always do everything for you. These bodies weren't made to last forever. I can tell you amen to that. They weren't made to last forever, so each and every one of us has an appointment with death. And when that appointment comes, we will stand before Jesus. And Jesus will either be your judge who condemns you or your king who welcomes you. That's the only two choices that you have. You see, God's appointed him to be judge of the living and the dead. And so when we stand before him, we will either stand in his righteousness and he'll say, come to my kingdom, or we'll stand in our own and he'll say, go to hell. One of the two. There's no middle ground. And at that point, you can't say, oh, you're serious. Whoops, I didn't know that. No, you will either go with him in his kingdom or you'll be apart from him forever. And the sad thing is, is that, that, that we can spend our whole lives, Jesus said this, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Our time on earth is this, right? Eternity is the whole rest. And to spend all of our time uh, collecting toys, building a, a reputation, making ourselves famous, getting a bunch of followers or whatever, even having buildings named after us or a star on a sidewalk. To, to do all of those things and, and get to the end of your life, this little bitty thing called your life. And to find out all you once held dear and built your life upon, all this world reveres and dares to own. All I once thought gain is gone. Right? So you can't take it with you. You fight and you fight and you fight and you do all this stuff and you build this little kingdom up and then you find out at the end that it's worthless. It doesn't go with you. And you have to stand before Jesus. And at that point, there's no second chances. Why not trust him today? All right, why not trust him today? Because I can tell you, pursuing that lifestyle, and you listen to the stories that are told, every person who's pursued that other lifestyle, it's empty. There's no fulfillment. And you know that. I don't have to convince you of that. But if you choose to follow Jesus, not only does he give you forgiveness of sins and eternal life, but he gives you new purpose and meaning for life, a reason to live, and a reason to, 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 to um, be here. Right? All you have to do is believe. Know that you're a sinner who needs to be saved. Believe Jesus came to save you. He lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, was buried, rose again the third day, conquering sin and death. And now he, by believing in him, you can have forgiveness of sins and life with him forever. That's quite a deal. Better than you're going to get anywhere else. And if you want to talk about that after the service, I'd love to talk to you about it. And if you have trusted in Jesus, who are you going to share your story with? You see, we're all unlikely citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We shouldn't have been there. Why? The covenants weren't for us. We're also rands, but we're recipients of God's grace, that we have a faith that's been passed down to us. And I know I've talked about sharing your story, and I do it quite a bit. And you might go, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. You say it every week. You, yeah, just stop telling me about it. Maybe I'll stop feeling guilty. I got it. I know, I know, I know. But do you know? Do you have it? 
Because if you do, who have you told? Right? Who, who have you told then? If you've got it already, if I don't need to tell you or remind you, who have you told about it? You see, you received the baton from somebody. Somebody told you about Jesus. Now, that might have been a Sunday school teacher. That might have been a parent. might have been a friend. You might have come here and heard it in one of the services. But somebody passed the baton on to you. You you are a believer here today because somebody gave it to you. Right? The good news of the gospel. And you received it. Now, the question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to give it to somebody else? Right? Are you going to invest it in another person's life? Are you going to, are you going to do that? Or are you going to go, you know what? I'm in the kingdom. To hell with them. Right? Is that what you're going to do? I don't need to share it with anybody. I'm in the kingdom. I'm okay. I don't, they don't need to hear the story. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? In your bulletin, There's a sheet of paper. One side has what we call the impact list. Those are the folks. You don't have to go looking for them. Those are the people that are already in your life. Friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, uh, classmates, teammates. Those are the people that you already know, you already come in contact with. And my guess is you already know, uh, you have at least an idea, do they know Jesus? And if you don't think they do, tell them. They may not think you know about Jesus. Right? Start there. And if you can't think of a name, pray. God, give me a name. And then on the other side of that, it's your story. It's an outline for how to tell your story. Here's my simple challenge for this week. Since you all got it. Just do it. Just do it. I dare you. And see how God wants to use it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, just this reminder of your plan, which was determined before the ages, your perfect plan, that even we, would be able to have a seat at the table. That even we could be a part of your kingdom. We who were the furthest away. We who were the least deserving of anyone. We who were the Gentiles, the unclean ones. And yet your love is so mysterious and so boundless. And so overwhelming and all-consuming, so perfect that you could love even us. And your mercy and your grace so deep that we couldn't ever fathom the depths of it. Lord, I pray that we would be captured and we would be blown away once again by the old, old story. And Lord, I pray that this week you would give us courage. Lord, I pray for each person here who uh, follows you that, Father, that even now, right now, you lay on their hearts a name. And I pray that you give them the courage to cross boundaries if they need to, 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 to fight bias if they need to, to do whatever it is you call them to do to be a faithful witness, to tell their story about how Jesus has changed everything. Lord, help us to be a people who care. Who care about the eternal destinies of those who are around us. And I do pray. I pray for a revival here and a revival in this community and a revival that sweeps this land. Or we know it's not going to be through a group or a person. It's going to be through your spirit. 
and that's going to be when we see you face to face that all the wrongs are made right and that your kingdom is one that we will see and live in and run with you in we pray these things in Jesus name amen